Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. On Perpetual Chess, I have weekly conversations with chess players, personalities, authors, and adult improvers about their lives, their careers, and about chess improvement. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Perpetual Chess. We have another guest that I am excited to speak with this week. He is a grandmaster. He is a FIDE trainer. Uh, he does a lot of work with the U.S. Chess Youth Team, World Youth Teams. Um, he's been a resident GM at the St. Louis Chess Club many times, which is how I became a fan of his video presentations. Um, he's been a top 50 player in the U.S. Uh, he's beaten Greg Shahadi in blitz matches. He thought he was off the grid, but I, as we were just discussing, I found him. So Grandmaster Robert Hungoski, thank you for joining the show. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me. So, yeah, as we were just discussing before we press the record button, uh, you keep a pretty low profile for a young American Grandmaster trainer. But your your videos on St. Louis, your videos in, as a resident Grandmaster with the St. Louis Chess Club, of course, have found their way to YouTube and have have developed a following. And I, for one, really enjoyed them. But um, and you're joining us here from Buenos Aires, where you're now living. But so how how do you spend your time when you're not off coaching world youth teams, Robert? Um, well, I'm a pretty much full time chess professional, you could say. Uh, and I say professional instead of player because really playing probably the 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 least I do of the chess world. So aside from like you mentioned. Um, working at the St. Louis Chess Club and doing the World Youth Cadets in Pan Am, I'm regularly coaching, uh, you know, on a day-to-day basis and then preparing for tournaments and playing uh, a few tournaments every year, every chance I get. So, so I try to, to really explore the entire spectrum of possibilities that the chess world allows. I've also gotten my FIDE Arbiter's title um, quite recently, and I'm working on the International Arbiter title now. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, I'm trying to leave the <clears throat> no, no stone unturned. Well, except for your, your scant online presence. Well, you know, I'm working on it. <laughs> good. Yeah, I saw your website looks pretty good, actually. Um, oh, thanks. Yeah, that's actually new. I just uh, I'm still you know working on a few things. It's not totally finished, but but yeah, it's getting there. Excellent. And with these FIDE titles, like a FIDE trainer and FIDE arbiter, what what goes into getting those? Well, um, it's all about norms, right? So just like getting the IM title or the GM title, you know, FIDE requires you to create to get norms, which are basically. Uh, you know, performances or experiences. Um, fortunately, you know, for the arbiter title and the trainer title, you, you don't actually have to score, you know, points against other arbiters or something like that. Um, so, so getting into the tournament and then not doing anything too terrible is, uh, is usually going to get you the norm. So, uh, so yeah, it's basically, you know, having a good relationship with arbiters that are willing to vouch for you and, and give you a shot at, uh, at working in their tournaments. And, and once you have that, I think you're in business. And do you have a, a long-term plan in terms of uh, being an arbiter or uh, running tournaments? I have no long-term plan in terms of anything, <laughs> basically. Um, so so I, I, I like to go with the flow. So uh, my philosophy is more of... Uh, just being ready for opportunities when they do present themselves. So I'm figuring, you know, that the arbiter title will come in handy someday. Uh, I don't know how and I don't know when, but it will. I mean, it was sort of the the same philosophy that I had with the, with the trainer title later, you know, all these opportunities came up uh, coaching, the, the U.S. team at these World Youth and Cadet events uh, and St. Louis. So uh, I think, you know, that, that definitely helped. 
So, so yeah, it's just a question of being ready. So what did you do to get the FIDE trainer title? So there are quite a few echelons in the totem pole of trainer titles. Uh, I'm currently a FIDE senior trainer, which is the highest title. And that title you apply for by resume. So if you go into the FIDE website, they have all the requirements for each title. Um, so up to FIDE trainer, you actually have to take courses and, you know, satisfy some rating requirement, you know, some kind of coaching requirements where your students need to be of a certain rating. Um, but when you apply for the FIDE senior trainer title, they, they start taking into account, you know, whether, you know, you're a grandmaster, whether you've coached players that are above 2,600, whether you've coached, uh, students who have won some kind of gold medal at world championships, or whether those are cadets, youth, or overall. So, so it's much more, um, I would say, tailored rather than just like a sort of blanket requirement. Okay. And was there a lot of back and forth to sort of make sure that you were okay for this um, to be granted the FIDE senior trainer title? No, not really. I mean, uh, I, I had... I had a pretty good year <laughs> in coaching terms uh, where I was coaching uh, or at least working as a second for a couple of grandmasters that did really well and uh, also at the World Cadets that was held in Brazil a couple of years ago. One of my students won the gold medal so I felt like that was the right time to really ask for it and uh, they, they really just said, oh, okay, <laughs> you're good. And are, are you able to divulge like who your student was or who the grandmasters were? Um, I can tell you who the student was. Uh, I, don't, I think the grandmasters are a little bit more sensitive about that stuff. Um, I was coaching uh, a, a very talented player from the Chicago area named Aaron Emrikian. Uh, I was just for you know full disclaimer. I wasn't his his coach like regular coach during the year. Uh, he was a student of Mezgin Amanov. Uh, I was just prepping him during the tournament, so doing a lot of game preparation and then analyzing the games he was playing, giving him my opinion of where I thought, you know, the kind of games I thought he should be aiming for and the ones he should be avoiding, those kinds of things. So, so yeah, it was more like a tournament, a specific tournament coach than his overall coach. Gotcha. Yeah, mezkin has got some strong students, it seems like. Oh yeah, he's got a he's got a very impressive record, especially at these events with the the young players. Yeah. So, having been to several of these events with the young players, like what do you notice about today's uh, young, um, you know, young talents? Like, what are what are their study habits like? Is there anything you notice that uh, is is different from your generation? I remember when I was a player. I mean, I was fascinated with all these youth events. It's the reason why I became a professional chess player, basically. And I was always in awe when I would go to these events and there would be like these famous chess players as coaches and you would get to talk to them and it was like, whoa. Today, there is like no reverence whatsoever. You could, you could have, you know, like Magnus telling you you should play this opening and the kids would be like, what are you talking about? You have, mm. you have no clue. Like, you don't know, you know, and I think, you know, that's overall a good thing. Uh, you know, nobody takes your word for it. You know, you have to prove yourself constantly. And overall, I think that's a good quality to have. Uh, so that's one of the main differences that I'm perceiving. Also, you see a lot of, a lot more fighting chess, you know, before it was common practice that if, you know, an experienced master got a worse position against you, you would offer him a draw, right, and just sort of cash in on your good fortune. Now that's unheard of, you know. Uh, the kids, they just want to rip your head off. Mm-hmm. And, and, they do. and I think, yeah. And they do, and I think that's a great thing, too. So, so those, I think, are the, some of the differences that stand out the most to me. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a bit older than you. I'm uh, 42 now, and... When I was a kid, I you know I made it to like low master, and 
back then it seemed like becoming a grandmaster was kind of like a lifetime achievement award. You know, like, Mm -hmm. I mean, there were the handful of uh, world elites. But other than that, there were people who took many years to become grandmaster um, and worked and worked at it. And now it just feels like it's just a speed bump for a lot of these kids. Yeah. And uh, there's also a lot of players that never made it to grandmaster. That's kind of a crime that they didn't because in today's day, they, they would have probably been like 2,600. You know, so so I think a lot of players were sort of unlucky, uh, sort of wrong time, wrong place. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, with with all the the information and the technology available, it makes sense that a lot of kids are are reaching you know the GM title so soon because they've got all this time and energy, which is basically what you don't have when you get older. And, and they can just pour it into chess. So it doesn't really surprise me that you're getting like 14, 15 year old GMs. Um, with a little guidance, I, I don't think that's, that's outrageous. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, I guess. I mean, it's still, I don't know. I still find it hard to fathom in another sense. But I mean, when you, when you see them in action and you see them calculating, I mean, you can sort of understand. And do you, so do you have a sense for, like, like, is there like one thing you see them doing in terms of like, are they just doing tactics all the time or are they devouring books as well? Um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure they're, they're spending like at least seven hours a day looking at chess nonstop. And if you do that, you know, every day for five or six years, you're going to be pretty good. Um, especially if you have, you know, that brain plasticity that like an eight year old has where right. they just absorb everything like a sponge. So imagine You know, you're an information sponge, and for five years, usually they say it takes 10 to be a GM, but, but, you know, say that maybe like five or seven years, you know, if you start really early, you can do it. You know, like the 10,000 hour rule, that kind of thing? Yeah. Um, You know, it's not surprising. They've almost by osmosis just reached across this plethora of information and taken it all in. So I think that a lot of, you know, these uh, like impressive tactics that you're mentioning, it's almost like a reflex for them. Uh, You know, having done thousands and thousands of chess puzzles, read, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of chess books, you know, hundreds of hours of coaching, you know, hundreds of tournament games, all of that stuff eventually works its way into your you know, subconscious decision-making process, and then you're you're off to the races. You know, yeah, it, it's it's something, and I'm curious to see how it continues to evolve because it's a trend that it's not slowing down currently. Um, yeah, no, and especially now that uh, I'm seeing, I think you know, there's there's a lot of information out there in terms of study materials, and. What's going on now, I feel, is that all of that information is being sorted out, right? What, what is the best way to take all that information in? So you're getting a lot of uh, like general principles or established principles that are being reprocessed, repackaged, and presented in a more efficient way, you know? Like before, when I was growing up, I, I sort of barely made the cut with technology, you know? Like growing up... We didn't really have internet yet. Uh, there was basically no kind of materials online, no live transmission of tournaments. You know, the informant was still around uh, in the classical sense of it. So, you know, it was very messy to study. Uh, you would still hear grandmasters recommend, you know, Zurich 1953. <laughs> Yeah. Nimzovich is my system. Today, all that stuff is, is like, okay, you know, it belongs in a museum. So now you have books like, you know, Sam Shanklin's uh, Small Steps to Giant Chess Improvement, The Woodpecker Method, all of these really fascinating new takes on classical principles. You know, uh, I think it's very exciting. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I ask for book recommendations basically every week and 
and uh, Zurich, Zurich 1953 in my system, they they still come up a lot. But but I agree that lately a lot of guests have been talking about kind of the difference between skills and knowledge uh, mm. when it comes to chess. And I I do think that those books, especially my system, they they might. I mean, I think they might teach knowledge more than more than they help you build like actionable skills. Oh, I, I think my system is one of the most unreadable books of all time. <laughs> I mean, I would I would not I would not recommend it to my worst enemy. I don't. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't get it. I never got it when I read it. I said it was good because I felt like I had to say that. Right. Uh, so. So yeah, if you're listening out there, don't waste your time. There's so many good books. I mean, some people will still go to bat for it. I'm. <laughs> uh, you, I you, mean, at this point, you know, they probably read it a couple of times. They have to. You know what? What are you going to do? They got to go down swinging. But uh, today, you know, all of those principles that were revolutionary when the book came out. I mean, when the book came out, what was it like in the early 30s, late 20s? It must have blown everybody away. But all of that stuff has been incorporated you know into into you know your daily chess life you know you don't even think about that stuff it's sort of a given so you don't really need to read a 300 page book to tell you that you want to put a knight on the outpost and that kind of thing um i mean i'm sure i'm I'm oversimplifying it a little bit uh and also perhaps my contempt for the you know pedantic bad translation, you know, yeah. that you, you encounter in, in the book has something to do with it. Perhaps it's more fun in German, but yeah. I so, doubt it. Nothing is more fun in German. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where Magnus stands on the book, but I think I remember seeing some sort of Chess 24 stream or outtake where he was kind of uh, lampooning the concept of overprotection. Yeah. I mean, you know, chess goes probably like everything else. From, from one end of the spectrum to the other, and then it creates some kind of synthesis somewhere in between. Um, so, I, I mean, there's definitely a lot of truth to it, but I think it also bred a lot of dogma that you you saw a lot with, you know, during the 50s and 60s, especially with, you know, the Soviet school, which was all about scientific approach and, everything very neat today you're seeing you know like alpha zero just throw everything at the kitchen sink at you and it works so now it seems like everything's going in the other direction you're seeing players like mamadiarov Wei Yi, all these guys playing insane chess it looks more like from the romantic era than from you know coldly cold and calculating you know yeah, did you happen to catch the Carlson Caruana game from Isle of Man a few days ago? Um, yeah, uh, I did. I don't remember it off the top of my head. If you tell me yeah, a little bit, of- I mean, I don't remember the moves, but it involved uh, Magnus castling queenside. He had like doubled c pawns and no b pawn and an isolated a pawn. Um, yeah, uh, it actually reminds me of a game that Carlson won against Wesley So from the Sinkfield Cup. Uh, where he he actually made reference to some Botvinnik games uh, because he had this completely shattered pawn structure in an end game, and you know he won, I would say, pretty easily. So so it would be one of these sort of counterintuitive, uh, pragmatic decisions that really is typical of Carlson. Right? Yeah, as as something of a chess dinosaur, I just I look at those games and I'm I just. They're so beyond <laughs> beyond my pay grade, <laughs> like as ha- as having been, you know, of the generation that's raised in the classics and that is not like uh, studying um, the new school as much. I mean, I just see it. And obviously um, there's lessons to be learned from it, but I kind of don't know where to begin. Yeah, well, I mean, I th- you know, the thing about that game, I-, I remember it now, is that there were queens on the board. So, you know, he had his king completely exposed on the queen side. Uh, I think that's the game you're talking yes, about, right? Yes, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, so that that was definitely uh, way out there. But um, I remember, you know, if, if you check out these, um, you know, another book that I think is actually still excellent is Botvinnik's 100 Selected Games. And that was sort of a, a Bible when I was, 
growing up and, and working my way up the ranks in the, in the chess world, you know, it was sort of a must read book. And it's really a book that has stood um, the test of time because Bobinick, you know, he's got this sort of scientific approach to chess, but he does it in a way where he avoids dogma, right? He never takes a principle for granted. You know, he's always saying, okay, I'm paraphrasing, right? So he's always saying, this is the principle, right? Now that that's clear, let's see how we can break it, right? right. Let's, look, let's look for the first opportunity that we get to break the general principle. And I think that's a very healthy way of approaching chess strategy, right? You want to... You want to learn as many general principles as possible, and once you have them down, you want to break them the first chance you get, right? You want to find all of these exceptions because, you know, good players, and they, everybody knows all the general principles, but really good players, they know when to break them. You know, they have this sixth sense of saying, okay, but here I can go into this end game with doubled isolated pawns because X, Y, and Z, or, you know, like Carlson here, I can castle queenside even though my king's totally exposed because... You know, I can make it work because of this particular line. Now, I don't know about that Carlson game. It looked very suspicious to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, um, but I mean, he got away with it. So. Yeah, yeah, and it, it's it is a, it's interesting what you say about the Bafanek book because that's sort of where I think club players and players at at my level, like I would not have the confidence to feel like I know when when to break the rules. Like if I study a certain opening and I've seen it in action and I can incorporate the idea, that's one thing. But, but to actually mm -hmm. generate it myself and feel comfortable playing it uh, seems uh, a bridge too far. Yeah, well, I mean, you got to crash and burn a few times yeah. before you, you get the hang of it. So, so that's why it's important. You know, if you're if you're trying to get better uh, to play a lot because you need to make a lot of mistakes, get them out of your system. Yeah, and I, so what's going on with your game? I mean, I, I know you, I think you mentioned on your website your, your focus primarily on training now, but it does, I saw you played in the U.S. Open. You're, you played uh, in Brazil, so you're making the occasional appearance. What's, uh, what's your, your current, do you have any current goals with chess, or is it just sort of play when you get a chance? No, I still have some delusions of, of grandeur. Uh, mainly, I, I, uh, I don't play nearly as much as I used to, so I I have to pick my tournaments carefully, and it's been a, sort of a lifelong dream of mine to play in a U.S. championship. So that's why I go to the U.S. Open because you know on the off chance that maybe I'll have an, an inspired week and uh, and and get that coveted spot for the U.S. championship. So that's a tournament that I like to play every year. Um, another tournament that really motivates me and gets me excited is the World Cup. So that's why I, I always play in the Continental Championship every chance I get. Since um, that awards, I believe, four or six spots for the World Cup. I think it's six. Uh, so those are, you know, must-play tournaments for me. If, if I really had to boil it down to maybe two events or three events a year, those would be it. That That's interesting. I wouldn't have been able to uh, dissect your motives without, um, you know, without your having explained it, but it does make sense. Someone, you know, uh, at the at the grandmaster level, but not just going to automatically get an invite to tournaments like that. I guess it, it makes sense to pursue them. Um, and with the Continental, are you, are you uh, I know as we were, I know that you're uh, half Argentinian, half American, are you citizens of both countries? Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm representing the U.S., uh, always have, but uh, my mother is Argentinian and my father is American. Uh, so even though I was born in the U.S., in Argentina you automatically get citizenship if one of your parents is a citizen. So it's, a, it's sort of a given. So yeah, I do have uh, I do have both. So have you ever considered playing for Argentina instead of the U.S.? No, not really. Uh, Argentina, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating country. Uh, I live in Buenos Aires right now, which is 
city that you know I, I love. Uh, but Argentina, it's a little bit messy in terms of politics, and that extends to the chess federation. And uh, especially when I was very young, and uh, it didn't really seem tempting <laughs> to make the right. switch. And also, you know, when I would play in Pan Ams, which was really my, my first exposure to international competition, you know, it was uh, a very motivating thing to play for the U.S. team and to be part of a team that brought, you know, famous, world-renowned players as coaches. So you really wanted to be a part of that. So it never really occurred to me to switch federations. Like, I, I didn't want to miss out on on that. And later, you know, uh, as I got a little bit better, maybe as I became a master, I benefited greatly from playing for the U.S. while living abroad because I would get invited to all these round-robin tournaments since I would be considered a foreigner. You know, and for round-robins, you need a lot of foreigners to play. So I would always represent the U.S. in tournaments outside of the U.S. So uh, I would get a lot of invitations, you know, and I would get you know, free entry fees, free room and board, all these kinds of um, perks, just by virtue of being a U.S. player. So that eventually just snowballed, and uh, and I, I never looked back, really. It was, uh, it's been a pretty good ride. Cool. Well, I'm glad to hear it, and I'm certainly not trying to... Uh... Not trying to kick you out of the U.S., um, kick you out from under the umbrella. But uh, and, but I, one thing I'm just wondering about is with the World Cup, uh, don't they do like regional uh, qualifications for it? Like are, are there right. South American slots that you could compete for? Yeah, no, that's uh, – and also uh, you could argue that getting into the Olympic team of yeah, I want that, South was, American team would, would be more likely than the U.S. team. Um, but yeah, what you're saying about zonal events, I think that's what you're yeah. referring to. Uh, that's also true. So that's another chance that South American players get that we don't really get in the U.S. Because in the U.S., the zonal tournament is the U.S. championship, okay. uh, which is actually a closed tournament, right? So um, the U.S. championship, I think the first four or five spots, I think it's five spots qualify for the World Cup. So so the U.S. has a very particular arrangement where the national championship is actually the zonal event as well. So that's a little bit unfortunate, but um, but overall I think the balance is pretty positive, so I'll, I'll take that hit. <laughs> gotcha. And you're not able to do both. You can't play the zonals in South America and otherwise uh, try to represent the U.S.? Or no, represent no, the you, U.S., I should say. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Okay. Well, sorry I couldn't come up with a, a, a hack for you here, Robert, but <laughs> I, I, I did my best. Um, so, um, when you're, so aside from the world youth teams, you, you do some Skype coaching? Oh, yeah. I mean, all the time. I actually do – I only do online coaching. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of uh, – I, by accident, I came across this very interesting <laughs> economic model that when I was living in the U.S., I had all these students that I would coach online. And recently, when I moved to, to Buenos Aires, you know, I, my lifestyle really didn't change too much because all of the work I do is online. So I realized that I can actually move around quite freely without really impacting my, my work. And... Also, uh, the exchange rate is very favorable here in Argentina, yeah. so uh, so it's it's really uh, working out quite well. And I think it's a it's an approach that a lot of professional uh, chess professionals, and especially you know GMs in in my range, that we're like, we're not super GMs, you know, we're 
we're sort of old for GMs. You know, once you you hit thirty, it's like you're you're a dinosaur. Hmm. So so you know, all of all of us that that uh, work as coaches, you know, I, I see a lot of players sort of relocating, especially in the U.S. You know, you have a lot of players that are from other countries. Uh, you know, like oh, I don't know, caucus area or the former Soviet Union, where you know, if you have a few students in the U.S., then you can uh, actually make a pretty decent living. You know, in I don't know, like Russia or wherever. Yeah, well, I was thinking of GM Kamsky, who I mean, I don't think he's uh. I know he's spending some time in back in Siberia now. Is there or is it Novosibirsk? Um, Nova yeah, I, I'm, I, I don't I don't really know where he's from originally, but I know he's he's not living in the U.S. anymore. But then you also have some expats. I know uh, uh, I've never met him personally, but I know Bill Pascal. He's from Massachusetts. Right. Yeah, I played him Hungary. many years ago. Yeah. Yeah, he's sort of a pioneer, I guess, because he's been living in Hungary for a very long time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting, uh, sort of getting the expat vibe and I'm digging it. Yeah, it makes sense. And, uh, you know, I'm a big fan of Buenos Aires, as I was telling you before. Um, so uh, yeah, it sounds pretty good to me. Um, and one thing I wanted to ask you about, just cause I, I was like looking, I was looking through your tournament history, or I think you might've mentioned it in a video and, uh, not surprising since you've spent years in Argentina, but you played in the mythical Mar del Plata. I have, yes. And um, I played it in the, well, Mar del Plata has, the tournament has mutated over the years, and it's definitely not what it used to be before. It was like this invitational where you had players like Fisher and Spassky that would, that would regularly play. Now it's an open tournament. It's a pretty decent tournament. Um, and I played it this year because no American has ever won it. So that was kind of uh, one of the reasons uh, I I signed up. And also, it's a really cool city. I don't know if you got a chance to go there when you were. I in did. Argentina. I was. I looked at some pictures <laughs> in, in yeah. preparation for this interview. This interview. It looks beautiful. And just yeah, to, sorry, I just wanted to give listeners a little more background, or you could, but just I mean most probably know about the King's Indian variation and the the history of, uh, you know, the annual tournament, but a, a little bit more color on that might be helpful for some listeners who might be a, a little bit newer to chess history. Well, um, at the risk of embarrassing myself, <laughs> I really don't know that much in terms of the history of the Mardo Plata variation, except that there is the variation with that name. Um, I do know that it was considered one of the main stops, you know, in the the elite players tour during the the year in the uh, late fifties, early sixties, um, and I think probably the peak of that was when Fisher played. I think Fisher played in fifty eight and fifty nine. He actually didn't do so well. Um, then he went over and played the tournament in Chile and did it even worse. Um, but, um, that's probably more of a question for, for like John Donaldson than me. Yes. You know, he, Everything he is really, a question for John Donaldson. Yeah. He really knows his stuff. So, <laughs> he sure does. so I'm just, I'm just going to leave it. Okay. <laughs> leave it no, there. Well, that was helpful. Yeah. Yeah. And the Mar del Plata variation. I mean, this is the little that I know, uh, one of the of course most fun and, uh, historic lines of the Kings Indian. And I think it was, uh, Gligorich and Nydorf who, uh, who played it in, in Mar del Plata. That's yeah, a, well, well, you know, Nidorf, he he's a really big part of the chess culture in Argentina. Argentina has a phenomenal chess culture. I mean, people have a genuine appreciation for chess. Um, they used to have very strong teams. I mean, they've gotten silver at a couple of Olympiads, I believe. They've hosted an Olympiad in 1978. And, you know, Nidorf was a big part of that. And a lot of these emigres from Second World War that settled in Argentina, and they began also, you know, coaching the local players and, you know, passing along the, the traditions from Europe uh, to the players here. So you had a lot of classically trained 
chess players and some very strong chess players, um, especially during, you know, 50s, 60s, and even in the 90s, you know, you had some very strong grandmasters that would all trace their lineage back to Nidorf. You know, everybody would have taken lessons with Nidorf. Larson also lived in Buenos Aires for many, many years. So, you know, Oscar Pano was, you know, you know, a player born and bred in Buenos Aires, also you know, among the best in the world during the 50s. So, you know, you've had everything at your fingertips here in Buenos Aires in an age where, you know, there was no internet, no kind of you know, software and that kind of stuff. So you had, you know, Nidorf and Larson there ready to teach you chess. So that's amazing. That would, yeah, it would be like having, you know, Fabiano or Anand, you know, just there saying, sit down, <laughs> you know, right. let's, let's have a coffee and talk about chess. So, so yeah, I think Argentina benef benefited greatly from that. And you still, you still feel it. You know, I, unfortunately, when I began playing chess, uh, Nidorf had just passed away, so I never got to meet him, but I did get to meet Larson. Um, so that was interesting. What was that like? Well, it was at a, a, a gala, I think, when he turned 70. You know, they, they, they had some uh, ceremony to honor him. And, you know, he gave his speech. It was at a very fancy uh, social club in Buenos Aires. And uh, they were giving out some, some books of like a game collection of his, and he was signing them. He was very nice. Um, I never took lessons with him, which I regret. Uh, would have been very interesting. But I got to see him play in many tournaments. I got to see him give lectures. Uh, so, yeah, it was fascinating. I was just getting started. I didn't really know who I had in front of me, really. Right. Um, so, so I wasn't able to take advantage of it fully. But you, you were, I mean, in your rise when you were playing a lot and, uh, you know, uh, very strong scholastic players. So some of that time you lived in Argentina, right? Yeah, I was always a terrible player as as a young person. So you know, I was never like a prodigy or even a promising player. I was urged to quit by many people. Huh? Uh, so, I, I don't know if uh, you're. <laughs> uh, are you serious? I'm having trouble. I mean, I know I get the part about not being a prodigy, but but I mean, it seems hard to believe the rest of it. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was, I had really bad results, you know, um, and uh, to the point where it might have seemed discouraging for the people watching <laughs> more than for me, because I was, I, I actually loved chess, so I, I was actually having a good time. But, you know, uh, when I would get home after a tournament, my mom would be, are you sure? Like, <laughs> you don't have to play if you don't want to. Like, what, <laughs> right. what are you talking about? I'm having a great time. Oh, because, like, you're losing so many games. <laughs> I'm like, well, I, I, had, I hadn't thought of it that way, but okay, I guess I'll keep doing it. I actually had a list. Uh, I tell this to some of the parents of my students. They think I'm joking, but I had a list. This was my game plan because I knew I wasn't the best or anywhere near it. So I had a list of all the players in my age group that were better than me. And my game plan was, okay, I'm going to work really hard to get better. That's obviously not going to be enough. So on this list, I'm going to start crossing out the players that quit. So if I get better and if all of these guys quit, then I should be the best. So, so the plan was twofold, right? Just not quitting and studying. And hopefully the players that were better than me wouldn't study and would quit. And then that's how I would catch up. Well, I'm glad you weren't thinking about like knocking them off, you know. That was, that was, you know, on the other side of the page. <laughs> okay. You know. that's, but, a, um, that's amazing. I mean, but okay, like, let's have some perspective. I mean, so you're saying you weren't a top young player, but you were way above average, right? Even even when you're encouraged to, to even when your family might have had some doubts about uh, whether it was the best use of your time. No, I was, I was not above average. Uh, I was always, you know, if, if the tournament had 50 players, I would be on the lower half. You know, like 25 would be a good tournament, <laughs> that so, kind of thing. So yeah. when did things start to change? Um, really when I was about 13 or, or 14. Uh, that's when I, I played my first Pan Am. 
my first international tournament. And it really opened my eyes and I said, oh, okay, that's, that's what I want to do. Um, you know, I want to compete internationally. I want to go to tournaments where the best players from other countries are playing and see how I do against them. I, I found that to be exhilarating. So, so that was my wake up call to really start, you know, studying hard, um, getting coached by, you know, professional chess players. Uh, investing in traveling and going to strong tournaments, that kind of thing. So, you know, when I was about 14, I was maybe like, I'd have to check that maybe like 1900 or 2000. And, and then I started, I, I got obsessed with chess. You know, I started to study like six, seven hours a day, every day, all the time, uh, just thinking about chess. And, and that's when it really took off. So then by the time I was 18, I got the IM title, and uh, and then I was sort of on track. Okay, and you were in Connecticut by then, by the, your teenage years. Um, or were you still in Argentina when? No, I I actually went to high school in Argentina. Okay, and I moved back to the U.S. when I was eighteen to go to college. Okay, uh, I went to the University of Connecticut. So so then I I stayed ten years in the U.S. Gotcha. And you, you mentioned on your website that uh, Grandmaster Bill Lombardi uh, helped convince you to go to college? Yeah. Uh, another, <laughs> you could say, uh, another concerned individual <laughs> concerned. saying. That's very funny. Yeah. Uh, no, but he was actually uh, instrumental in me getting the Grandmaster title. But I, I was really in a, in a slump after I got my... I am title. I felt okay. Now, now it's easy, right? Now, I'm, I'm on track. I've made up for lost time. You know, I, I really went from like 2100 to I am very quickly, and I felt that GM was just going to be right around the corner, and it wasn't like that. You know, I just hit a wall for a couple of years, and I got very discouraged, and that's when. I started uh, working with Lombardi, and and he he encouraged me to go to college, not because he was telling me, you know, you, this is not for you. <laughs> he was saying, <laughs> um, this is going to, you know, you're putting too much pressure on yourself. You need to, to really take a step back, maybe think about some other stuff, and then sort of come back with a, with a fresh view on things. Um, and he said, it's not like you're not going to, do chess anymore, you'll probably just play less, but you, by playing less, you can actually study more, even if you have, you know, academic obligations. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, I got my GM title my senior year of college, you know, middle of finals and everything. I was just uh, doing really well in every tournament I played, even though it was less tournaments. And were you, so you were, you weren't as able to play as much, but were you, able to keep up the study regimen that you developed or were you uh, cooling your heels on that a bit too? Um, I was studying less hours but more efficiently. So I wasn't doing like seven hours of chess every day, at least not, you know, sitting down in front of a board doing two hours break, two hours break, one hour, you know. It was more of, um, you know, thinking about, okay, where... Where am I having trouble, you know, pinpointing the problem and then doing some some targeted uh, training, right? Also being a lot smarter about opening preparations. So, you know, since I'm, I'm in college, I can't spend tons of time on the opening. So I, I, I changed my repertoire and made it a lot more practical so that it required a lot less maintenance. And, uh, and these sort of uh, thinking smarter about how I use my time really helped. So maybe I was doing two or three hours a day, but I was really getting more out of them, or at least just as much out of them as before when I was doing twice as much. Wow, that's interesting. And can can you think of any examples of uh, the targeting targeted training that you did? Like yeah. So so for example, you know, I I realized uh, 
you know, I, I would do, you know, in chess space, I would open up the database with my games, and I would select all the games that I would lose, you know, with the white, all the games I would lose with black, try to come up with some kind of common denominator, right? Um, really, Lombardi taught me to think of chess in terms of themes or patterns. So, so I would try to find the pattern in all of my losses. You know, okay, do I neglect my king safety all the time? Okay, if that's the case, then in my next tournament, my goal would be to lose the game because of anything rather than king safety, mm-hmm. right? So, so it would just be, just there's one thing that's not allowed, right? You cannot lose a game in the same manner you lost before. It's okay to lose in a new way, but but definitely um, make sure that you're mindful of sort of uh, your past experiences. So. What I would do is I would try to build my repertoire in such a way that I would avoid problems like king safety or I would avoid falling into positions where there's opposite color bishops in terms of, you know, middle games or something like that. So, yeah, it would be, you know, starting off with some kind of statistical analysis saying, okay, I lose a lot of games in this opening. You would go into that opening and see, okay, what are some of the common patterns in that opening that are creating problems for me? And then you would just try to break it down. And, you know, hopefully you would have a guy like Lombardi telling you, okay, well, you should go check out these games or you should go read this book because you're having problems with these patterns. So, you know, it would be something along those lines. But again, you know, getting better at chess, there's, there's really no, no established way of doing it, right? All of the information is scattered around. Nobody has really ordered it and presented it in an intelligible way, not even with all, all the software and technology available today. I know Varetsky had you know, this, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but he had this program that he developed, but it was basically just the tactics program, so a database with with problems that were sorted by theme. Um, But I think something along those lines needs to be done for strategy as well. Yeah, GM Rafael Lateo, who I'm guessing you've crossed paths with. uh, Yeah, he's a good good buddy of mine. Okay, he was just on the show uh, a couple weeks ago, and he he mentioned Dvoretsky's program as well. uh, Yeah, yeah, he's he's one of the Dvoretsky boys. Uh, So yeah, I mean, I I know he, he has they had brought Paretsky to Brazil to train the Olympic team. And I think he had, I don't know if he had gone to Russia to train. with. Yeah, he did. He told that story. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. Um, Funny how uh, one person talks about something that hasn't come up in a while and then boom, you hear it from someone else. Although you guys are connected, but yeah, that, uh, I mean, the closest thing I can think of, I don't know as someone at your level, if you've had any exposure to the steps curriculum, uh, from, Oh yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I've, I've got all of them. Uh, I've done all of them. Wow. And, uh, I always recommend them. I think it's a fantastic material, but again, it's very tactics oriented. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's less so they at least have some like create a pawn structure weakness puzzles, you know, and stuff Mm -hmm. like that, like more than other things, but, but yeah, it's still going to be primarily tactics. Yeah, so so it's very interesting. I think that you know the the market has really identified this problem and it's gradually trying to to address it. But I think we're we're still a, a ways off from from really getting that material. Yeah, it's true. Although, meanwhile, as we were talking about earlier, it's not like it's not like chess players are struggling to improve. Oh uh, well, I mean, I'm th- I'm sure that everybody's. At some I mean, point. I should it, say, it's, 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 actually, the glass, the glass ceiling that people are hitting. Yeah, is, I, yeah, I should is, clarify. It's a little bit different. I mean, most of the people listening to this actually are probably struggling to some extent to improve. If I were even trying, I certainly would be. But it's just the the young kids, you know, uh, pushing the limits of what's possible. You know, uh, getting better and better at younger younger ages. Those are the ones who sort of it 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 feels like. Uh, aren't struggling as much, even though they're putting tons of hours in. Yeah, I mean, they're probably still going to struggle. It's just that they're going to encounter the resistance 
a lot later than we're used to. So they're still going to feel the same frustration that we feel, but probably they're going to feel it when they're like 2,500 and they just can't get to 2,600, right? As opposed to like us, when we were like 2,100 and we we're like, how can I get to 2,200? Well, the feeling's probably going to be very similar, except, you know, the, the actual level at which we're playing is completely different. Uh, but I mean, there, there's always going to be some kind of ceiling that players hit and have to struggle to overcome. Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, so, what do you tell your students when they when they hit those points? Well, you know, I don't really address it in terms of you know, oh, you hit a ceiling. I, I just point out. I try to use the same process that I use for myself, you know, okay, where are you losing your games? What are some of the common patterns that are spread out across all your losses? You know, is, is the problem the opening or is there some kind of um, structural problem, you know, like deep down, like are, is there some principle that you're not mastering? Uh, are, are you too heavily inclined for tactics at the expense of strategy, you know, that kind of thing? And then pointing them in the direction of the materials that I think would help them. So maybe a certain book, maybe um, a collection of games. Uh, it really comes down to you know to what each individual seems to be lacking, and then you try to, to fill that that void. And you already mentioned a few books that. Unlike my system, you you do like like Bot Phoenix 100 selected games, but are there are there other books that you find yourself recommending uh, with reasonable frequency? Um, yeah, sure, absolutely. I mean, there's some really great books. I mean, all the Jeremy Silman books I think are are great. Um, you also have um, like a book that I can't believe doesn't get more press, which is uh, Laszlo Polgar's book. The big, uh, the big one? No, that's the one everybody knows about. But he did another one called Chess Middle Games, which huh. is really a fantastic book. It's um, it's the closest thing I've seen between like an intersection of tactics and strategy. Um, it's mostly a a book of chess problems, but it's all about middle game positions and based on some themes of strategy. So you'll see like one chapter will be the outpost and it's all of these tactics that come up where you need to make use of an outpost, for example, and, uh, and those kinds of things. I think it's a, it's a really fantastic book. Um, then you also have, I mean, the anthology of chess combinations uh, published by the chess informant, which I think is um, probably one of the the best books out there in terms of tactics. Um, let's see, other strategy books. Um, oh yeah, there's this book by Herman Gruten you've probably heard of called uh, Chess Strategy for Club Players. Yep. Yeah, he's been thought, on the show too. Yeah, he's a Oh, okay. Yeah, guy. I thought I thought that was a very good book. Um, all the Varetsky books uh, I remember when I read them, they were published individually. So I remember this book, Positional Play, was really great. It's, it was high-level stuff, very challenging material, but very good. Then you had, um, uh, I think one, he always wrote them with Yusupov. Um, Attack and Defense was another very good one. Later they republished them under the title of School of Chess Excellence in four volumes. So I think that, that that's how you would find it today. But I remember it specifically that book, Positional Play, to have been very good. Then a book that made a deep impression on me was by Alexander Baburin, Winning Pawn Structures. Uh, yeah, that one's out of print, I think. It's like, yeah. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's hard to find. Yeah, people swear by it. Yeah, no, it, it blew my mind. It was the first time I saw this deep uh, analysis and presentation of hanging pawns and isolated pawns and, you know, the close relationship that they have, you know, it got me thinking about pawn structures 
in a very deep way. Um, another book that I read when I was very young, I don't know how good it is really, maybe it's just nostalgia talking, but um, Max Erva wrote um, a two volume uh, series on the middle game called The Middle Game. Catchy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hard to forget. Um, but I mean, at, at, when, I was, when I was young, I was reading like, you know, a few books a week. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of stuff there uh, that I read that I don't know how much of it actually. Right. Uh, it's still like, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it didn't hurt. Right. But I, I wouldn't say, okay, this book really took me from A to B. It was all sort of a, a little grain of sand that kept uh, piling on top of it, one on top of the other. Um, then there were books that were just fun to read, like uh, Jonathan Rousen's books, because he's just such a great writer. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah, so, I mean, those are just a few off the top of my head. I'm sure there's more. Okay. I mean, that's, that's excellent. One thing that I wondered about in sort of reading your bio and kind of trying to read between the lines. So you met, you mentioned you studied, I mean, so you already liked chess, but then started putting in six, seven hours a day in your high school years. So, uh, and it, you kind of had to be convinced to go to college, you said by GM Lombardi. So do I infer that, that you weren't, you weren't that academically oriented as a, as a high school student? No, I was, I was terrible in high school. Uh, yeah. It was it was it was such a such a painful experience. <laughs> yeah, and it was mostly just I just didn't want to be there. You know, I felt right. like uh, um, you know, teenager, tons of stuff uh, going through my head. You know, just discovering chess, becoming obsessed with it, and then you know, I had to go take. I, I had Latin in my school. So. Yeah, that's pretty brutal. I yeah. Mean, no. No offense to any big Latin enthusiasts listening, but but yeah, I mean, it doesn't. It's not the most practical thing to learn. Yeah. No. I, I mean, later I would have been fascinating to study Latin. I mean, when I went to college, I, was, I actually wanted to be there, and I I wanted to to get my mind off of chess and focus on something else. So so it was a, the the timing was just right, and during high school, the timing was just wrong for just about everything. Um. So. So yeah, that was pretty rough, and fortunately later, academics started to fall into place, and I think it it really played a, an enriching part in my life because I did it. I did the right thing at the right time, so I got I got the most out of it. Yeah, yeah. I was just talking about this with my previous guest Camille Plikta, but I do I do feel like chess players. There's there's the strain that just crushes everything they do in terms of like uh you know strong young chess players there's the uh the um jennifer Hughes and you know uh tal shaked from you know i think somewhere between our generations but these people who are great at chess and they also like get into whatever college and may or may not pursue chess but they're just they excel at everything they do and then there's the people for whom chess is more of an escape um and and I can definitely identify. I was, I guess, somewhere in between, but I think it's often kind of polarized, like uh, Greg Shahadi, who I am excited to ask you about <laughs> soon, oh, soon yeah. enough on another topic. But he was he was not interested in school at all, you know, as I, as a student. I mean, he would study chess or study any game, you know, for hours. But in terms of just doing what someone told you, it was not really appealing. Yeah, and I think chess players have this... Uh work ethic, you know, after you've been studying chess for six or seven hours a day for like five, ten years, you know, you've got a, you've, you've got this skill, right? You've got this work ethic that you can extrapolate and apply to anything that, you know, motivates you. But the, the thing is, you have to be motivated to do it. You can't just sit down and say, I have work ethic, therefore I will do this now. And and excel at it because if you really don't care about it, uh, the work ethic isn't going to matter, right? You you need to have some motivation behind it, and and I feel like that's what, uh, I mean, just the juxtaposition of my experience in high school and college taught me was that, you know, in in high school I I could have had the work ethic as well, but I just 
didn't have the motivation, but in college it, it all fell into place and it was uh, it was a breeze actually. Huh. Yeah. Um, speaking of uh, GM Jonathan Rosen, who you mentioned, I'm lucky enough to have my hands on uh, his. He's got another book coming out uh, in a few weeks, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm hoping to chase him down for an interview. But uh, but I at least have his book. And I, one of the things he mentions is one of the formative things about chess. And he's an example of someone who excels at everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he says chess taught him to concentrate more than anything. OK. I mean, uh I'm, I'm not surprised. Uh, I don't know if I would really relate to that too much because I'm not sure how well I'm able to concentrate on like during a chess game period. Uh, <laughs> but um, but I mean everybody I'm sure gets their own particular benefits out of chess. Uh, I mean, you, you, now it's very popular to say, oh, chess helps you with this, helps right, you with right. that. You're good at math. You won't get Alzheimer's. You know, who knows? Um, I'm sure that being able to perfect your craft, whatever it is, whether it's chess or anything you can think of, you know, once you, you pour your uh, time, energy, and resources into it, uh, it's going to help you develop, you know, skills. Um, what I'm thinking, you know, in my particular case, I've always thought of as work ethic, uh, but it could be concentration. It could be anything else. Um, so yeah, I, I think chess is no different in that regard from, from any other kind of, uh, technical skill. Right. But just another, another outlet that someone could become fascinated with if if latin isn't doing it for them yeah sure uh and you know if you're into fringe activities that are not very economically viable then chess is definitely <laughs> for you um <laughs> well it seems like it's not so bad living in argentina and uh doing the uh the global arbitrage and uh Oh no! I mean, it, it, it's fun. It, it's it's a it's a beautiful game. You know, it's uh it's got this amateurish allure about it. So you feel like you're in this community uh, of peers where you know you you really don't need to say anything to understand exactly what the other person is going through or thinking. Um, but um, but if you want to make it as a chess player, it's just you know you should really know what you're getting into. Yeah, because, it's true. Um, most likely, you'll, you'll end up um, focusing your profession in terms of coaching, in terms of producing materials like uh, videos. I do a lot of videos, like you mentioned, for St. Louis Chess Club or for websites, uh, you know, or, or writing books or writing articles for periodicals like, you know, New in Chess or chess based magazine or informant, you know, you name it. So uh, most players that set out to be professional chess players will have a pretty good run, but then, you know, eventually you'll realize, okay, you know, I'm 30. Uh, even if I, even if I could keep playing forever and ever until the end of time, would I really want to do that? Uh, because, you know, you eventually get other priorities, other interests, and, uh, like, I still love chess, but I don't think I would want to just play chess tournaments. Yeah. Period, you know. Um, I find it rewarding to also coach, to also write, to also uh, try to learn to be an arbiter and look at the player's suffering instead of me being the one suffering. Um, and uh, I think it just gives you a, a, a richer perspective on everything. Well so, said. Yeah. So do you think you have a chess book in you? Oh, sure. Yeah. I've actually written a couple of chess books. I just never published them. Oh, interesting. Did you try? Or <laughs> No. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I would just start writing about something and then it, I would have like 200 pages and then I'd be like, oh, this is terrible. And then I just... <laughs> Sounds like a fiction writer. 
yeah, and then I would just leave it there. Um, so now I'm sure I could. I think I could write a chess book. I just don't know if I, if it would be something that anybody would be interested in reading. Um, well, if I mean, I, if it's like your lectures, I think people would be interested. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'll just do the lectures for now, and maybe in a few years when material starts to pile up and I can articulate it in a more intelligent way, I'll start thinking about publishing in, uh, pub, publishing it in book format. Okay. Well, something I, I encourage you to, to go down that road, although... Um, I understand your hesitance, but uh, so Robert, before we let you go, uh, I want to hear some stories. Um, we teased the one. So you've played some, I'll tell you, I mean, I mentioned, so I went to school with uh, Greg and Jen Shahadi and known them for like 30 years or something terrifying oh, wow. like that. Um, but so I remember in the aughts, as it's called, like you um playing a few blitz matches with Greg Shahadi, but you were the first person like Greg would periodically be setting up these matches with these people or just one would kind of break out. I mean, he used to even play Hikaru in kind of impromptu matches back when like he had some semblance of a chance because Hikaru was <laughs> not fully formed yet, but you were one of the first people I heard him say that, and, and being that Greg's been a professional gambler, he's, he's always been fairly astute about like when he's a favorite against someone and when he isn't in a blitz mm -hmm. match um as as lawrence trent can attest i'll, I'll do respect to, to lawrence trent um mm -hmm. but you were one of the first people who, who he was playing a match against and he wasn't sure if he would win so what do you remember about these matches uh back in the days well i remember that was fake humility because <laughs> greg would never play he would never grab a pawn unless he thought he was going to win because I don't think he he would, you know, put uh, his hard-earned cash at risk if he didn't think he was going to double it uh, during a chess match. So I think he, from the very beginning, he thought he had my number. And eventually his instinct proved him right because he did beat me in that match. Um, so this is the one that Jen filmed. Yeah, Jen I don't know. Filmed? I don't. Yeah, it, this match was for a very long time ago, and he actually almost humiliated me because I think he was beating me like six to one or six zero or something like that, and it was the first one to win ten games, and then I managed to tie it, uh, something like six six. So I don't know. Greg had some kind of a meltdown. He was really having such a great time. <laughs> I bet. You know. <laughs> You know, he was humiliating me. He was enjoying it, and you know, he was he was making jokes and talking to the crowd, and and I don't know. There was some kind of divine intervention, and I managed to to tie the match. And he was complaining all the time, and he was he was whining. He, was, he called a TD. Like like, what's going on? We're playing some blitz blitz match, and he just saw a TD and called him over. And I'm like, this isn't a tournament. Like, you can't call a TD. Like, we're playing blitz. Uh, so, you know, he, there was huffing and puffing and eventually he ended up winning the match anyway, because I mean, he's a half decent blitz player. So, you know, he can move the pieces fairly quickly and he has, you know, he blunders a lot, but he does it at a rate where taking advantage of those blunders costs you time. So he sacrifices material for time. That's basically his, his formula, uh, what I've gathered over the years. Yeah. And um, I would be interested to play him with some increment. But yeah, that's and, what uh, I think Lawrence Trent uh, trotted that out there at some point. I mean, he's tried a few different formats. And to be fair, the matches are always really close. They've played a few yeah. like online grudge match sort of things where they both. Yeah, I've, I've seen them. I've seen them. Okay. And I, I, I like the profanity. Yeah, I feel like I feel like that that was an important component because you see a lot of these sterilized matches that you know when when the cameras go off that's that's what you want to see. Yeah, and and I like this match. It had they put a little stank on it. I yeah. liked it. Yeah, I agree. It, it, it's mm -hmm. fun, fun, fun spectating. Well, I'm sorry that you didn't you didn't win. I thought you had gotten him. Um, no, no, I mean. You know, you you brought up this kind of 
suppressed memory for me. It was very traumatic. <laughs> I'm sorry. Him because he's been hanging it over my head ever uh, since. No, he would never bring that up. Oh, yes, he would. <laughs> okay. Well, sorry about that. My, my deepest apologies. Yeah. Um, maybe we can set up a rematch with some increment and uh, you can make it happen. But This interview but, was going so well. <laughs> no. And the problem, of course, is he'll only do it if he's, you know, he's pretty good about assessing his odds. So he's not going to do like a grudge match with Nakamura now, you know, <laughs> like. No, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't think he ever beat Hikaru. I mean, did he? Like, maybe. No, he no. Won't... He would take games from him, though. I mean, oh. which, which now he probably probably can't do anymore. But, but mm-hmm. yeah. I mean, yeah. Hikaru was always just too strong. Yeah, I mean, I remember like because Hikaru was born on December 9th of '87. I was born December eighth. So, so I've, I've, you know, we're pretty much the same age. So I've seen him yeah. in every every age group tournament, you know, throughout my career and he was always amazing so, yeah. i mean even when we were like eight he was still better than greg so wow uh yeah okay so maybe i'm misremembering that but um anyway yeah. um other stories i saw you got you have a picture with karpov on your website and i in my uh intrepid research it looked like you played him in a simul or is that what the picture's from no i i did play karpov in a simul but that's not what that picture is from that was actually um, the time I ran into Karpov at a chess camp he was doing in New York, um, I think it was last year. Yeah, last year. Um, so I just ran into him, you know, he's, he's very nice. Um, and I asked him if he remembered, you know, we played in a final. He said, no, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, he's, he's like one of my all-time favorite players. I, I use his games all the time for my lecture, so... You know, he was he was nice enough to to allow my dad, who was with me and uh, a friend of his, to to meet him and and take my picture with him. So uh, that's cool. Yeah. Any, any particular Karpov game that that we should check out? I mean, obviously there's legions, but yeah. Well, I'm a there's a um, there's this game. I'll, I'll give you three good Karpov games that I like to use quite often. One is his game against Yusupov. Um, the year, I think, was uh, 1980. Ah, I don't know. It's a very famous game. It's an open Morphe game. Okay. Um, then you have his game against Lautier. Uh, I think that's from 92. And then you have his game against Korchnoi, one of the many, of course, that uh, they played throughout the years. But this is the one, um, it's, an, it's a very famous isolated pawn game. Uh, let me just, I think it's game nine from their match in 1981. It's just a textbook example of how to work against the weak isolated pawn. So, so yeah, those three games, uh, I think, are, are really must-see Karpov games. Okay. Of course, there, there are dozens, right? But, right. Yeah. All right, good stuff. Um, any other stories that you, sh- you feel need to be told before, before we call it a day, Robert? Uh, need to be told? No, probably not. I don't, I don't think so. I mean, uh, you know been doing this for a lot of years so i'm sure there's there's stories but um they sort of fade into the background you know once you start doing you know day-to-day uh work on chess it's just uh it's more about you know okay what am i going to talk about in the next lecture right yeah how, how can i how can I work on this part of my game that's been a problem? Okay, which tournaments am I going to try to schedule this year? So, you know, all these stories that I'm sure I would have been fascinated with when I was like 13 or 14, just uh, sort of fall by the by the wayside after a while. I remember Lombardi used to tell me, you know, I would tell him some stories sort of in passing. I'd be like, you got to start writing some of this stuff down because, you know, you're going to forget 
And, you know, I, I actually love hearing stories from other chess players, but I never really think too much of my own. What about something from Lombardi? Is there any that, uh, that stand out that he told you? Oh, you know, he would, he would talk about, you know, Fisher a lot and uh, the match in 72. Uh, he was actually in the, the process of writing a book about Fisher uh, shortly before he, he passed away. And, um, I mean, you know, like taking the spark plugs out of, out of the car so he wouldn't uh, run away and, you know, forfeit the match, that kind of thing. Wow. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I also had my, my own Lombardi stories. I remember, uh, you know, he was a creature of New York. And uh, one time, you know, we were going to Brighton Beach, and you know, I swiped my Metro card, and uh, the turnstile, you know, it charges me for the ride, but it doesn't let me through. So I swipe it again, and it charges me again, and it still won't let me through. So I jump over it with the unfortunate luck that there's an NYPD officer coming down the stairs and you know he calls me over he sits me down and he says you're going downtown wow unbelievable and yeah and i tell him you know i'm like you know i've got this metro card and he was yeah yeah okay i've heard him all buddy and lombardi was there and you know he called he he tells the officer you know he he, he pulls open the, the his coat and he shows him a sergeant's badge and he says, he's with me. And the officer looks at Lombardi, who looked like anything but a sergeant <laughs> in the NYPD. And he says, are you really a sergeant? And I'm like, okay, so we're both going downtown. <laughs> <laughs> and Lombardi gets a little defensive, like, well, no, but uh, a friend of mine is, and he gave me this badge, and he told me if I ever have a problem that I should use it. And the other guy's taken aback. He's like, oh, okay, then then I guess you're both free to go. Wow. And we just, and we just left. And I was like, I, that just happened. Like, why, why, why aren't we arrested right now? And it's like, no, it's actually a real sergeant's badge. The story is true. So that works. I mean, if you have a sergeant's badge, huh. the, the, thing, the, the things you learn on perpetual chest. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, so, you know, I, I lived in New York for about five years, and, you know, we, I would hang out with Lombardi a lot. I mean, we would get together at least once a week, uh, talk about chess, and go out to dinner. So, you know, Lombardi was a very eccentric uh, character, so, you know, these kinds of things would happen all the time. I can only imagine. Yeah, I, met, I only met him once or twice, but, so, I, but yeah, it must have been entertaining. Oh, sure. Never a dull moment. Cool. Well, Robert, this has been this has been awesome. That, that's a great story to end on. Um, so, I'll link to your website. Uh, um, any anything else I should link to? Um, I'll put up a couple of my favorite of your YouTube lectures and uh, all the games we've mentioned and all that stuff in the books, etc. Anything else? Um, I should. Well, include? I mean, uh, if uh, if you're into my my lectures, I only have a few videos on YouTube, but I also do lectures for a website called chesslecture.com. Um, and then, of course, I do a lot of uh, writing for periodicals like uh, New in Chess, uh, Chess-based magazine. Uh, I've recently published some materials for a website called Modern Chess. So, yeah, if, if people are into, into my stuff, they can check it out there. Okay, and they can reach you through the website? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, Robert, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. Special thanks, as always, to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank everyone who helps spread the word about Perpetual Chess. The ways to do so include writing a positive review on Apple Podcasts or another podcast platform, telling a friend, spreading the word on social media. All of that stuff helps. But... Most of all, I want to thank the people who support the show financially. Without you guys, Perpetual Chess would not be possible. 
So I would like to give thanks to the following people and entities, my PayPal and Patreon Perpetual Chess partners. Here we go. They are extra special thanks to Chessable.com and Quality Chess Books and the Capital City Chess Club, Apprentice Chess Twitch Channel, Andrew Bach, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Kathy Cow, Chad Oliver, Dan O'Hanlon, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Greg Natal, Greg Shahadi, Guvin Manet, Jens Green, John Jernigan, John Cromarty, Kelly Palmer, Lone Pine Chess, Lorraine Duray, the law offices of Stuart Katz, Michael Can, my main man, Moonmaster 9000, Seattle Chess Club, Thomas Stonix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryan, Todd Kennedy, and I'd also like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Vallega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alex Pejas, FM Andre Tarakov, Andrew Perry, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Mullis, Chad Hilton, Chris Balcom, Chris Flanagan, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalicki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Courtney Fry, David Kofer, Daniel Gell, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Lucas of US Chess, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Cramley, CEO of Chessable.com, Daylin Shelton, Dwayne Edmonds, Ethan Smith, Donnie Ariel, who may be an IM elect or maybe just has the titles, and I'm not sure if that makes him an IM elect, but thank you, Donnie, anyway. Fox Valley Chess Club, Frank Tortoris, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vanderveld, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Shu, Harish Srinivasan, James Banastia, Jason Onfang, Jason Woolham, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, JJ Stranad, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, John Zlosnik, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joel Rocky, John Thompson, GM Josh Friedel, I am Kare Christensen, WGM Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, I am Kostya Kovutsky, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Larry Reiforth, Laura Belyavsky, Lucio Casada Silva, Martin Knudsen, Matthew Passi, Matthew Tedesco of SeattleChessMeetup.org, the Mechanics Institute Chess Club of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Miguel Araspide, Mr. Mike Shahadi, Nate Salon, Neil Bruce, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passi Passan, and Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Swanee, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Peter Merrifield, Randy Temple, Ricky Grahava, Roy Yearwood, Ryan Berg, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, WGM Tatyav Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tomas Komanich, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Victor Vrancouz, William H. Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Chang, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks a lot, everyone. I will catch you all next week. Thank you.